Volkswagen plunges, facing criminal charges for cheating on emission standards. Software is at the heart of the scandal. What does it mean for Apple, Tesla, and a future of smarter cars? Chang and this is Bloomberg West coming up. The new iPhone 6S goes on sale this Friday. The verdict? You should buy one, but not for the reasons you might think. Plus, speaking of new software, Microsoft Office gets its first upgrade in three years. How the company is hoping to change the way we work. And China's President Xi lands in Seattle to meet with Tim Cook, Jeff Bezos, Satya Nadella, and other top U.S. business leaders. We are live from Seattle. All of that ahead on Bloomberg West. First, though, to our lead. Volkswagen is at the center of an emissions rigging scandal that's developing by the hour. Regulators from Germany, France, South Korea, Italy, all now vowing to join the United States in scrutinizing VW's diesel cars. The result could be billions of dollars worth of fines. And the heart of the issue is malprogrammed software. So is this a cautionary tale about smarter cars, tech-savvy cars, and with reports that Apple is making advances in its own car development, how is the role of tech in the auto industry changing? Techonomy founder David Kirkpatrick is with us from New York and with me here in the studio, Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis. David, I want to start with you. This Volkswagen story is just mind-blowing. I mean, what is your takeaway from this? Is this a cautionary tale about more and more technology in our cars? Well, it's a cautionary tale about corporate malfeasance at one of the highest levels we've ever seen. I think it's a scandal of the greatest proportions. I think the consequences for Volkswagen are going to be far greater than a few billion dollars in fines. I'm certain the CEO will lose his job. It wouldn't surprise me if the company goes under as a result. I'm not kidding. This is horrifically inappropriate behavior, and I don't think that the companies acknowledge how bad it is. Uh, in terms of the software piece, it's fascinating that we have now moving into a world which we call the Internet of Things, where software is going to be in everything, and now we have an example of the world's largest automaker using the software that they install in their thing, their car, to deliberately break the law. That is a terrible precedent as we're moving into a new world of software to find everything. I, I find it just plain terrifying. So David thinks Volkswagen could, could go out of business at the result of this, which, you know, it's, it's such a storied brand, Bob. You know, what do you think the real implications are here? Well, exactly as David said, I mean, the notion that they're using software to intentionally Break, get around the rules and, and break the law. Right, it's not just that it was a software yeah. problem, it was an intentional yeah, software Yeah, I mean, problem. that's that's a big issue, but, and this is fundamentally the concern we have as we move into the Internet of Things, is we're moving into this world where there is so much connectedness coming, and when you've got problems with one system and then there's other problems with another system, then you try and marry those two together. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot of this over-eagerness in IoT start to pull back. And I think connected cars, smart cars are exciting and interesting, but I think there are going to be some big challenges, you know, especially if Apple wants to try and do something by 2019. Well, it's interesting, you know, Apple kind of getting dragged into this right now with the reporting from the Wall Street Journal that Apple is making advances in its own car development. David, you know, should we be worried about, you know, not, not, not just Apple, but other, other car makers and, and more problems like this in the future? Well, I think all of us have to make a decision. Who do we trust? And I think um, the trust towards Volkswagen has been, again, horrifically broken. If you talk to anyone who owns one of the cars involved, everyone I've talked to, and I've talked to quite a few because I happen to have a lot of environmentally responsible friends, they think, they're all, they want to have Volkswagen buy their car back. They don't want to take it in and have it repaired. They've been driving it sometimes for years thinking they were being environmentally responsible. Now they're told, no, you've been emitting 40 times more of this, you know, polluting gas than you thought. That's just awful. In terms of Apple, I don't think it really has anything to say about Apple any more than it has anything to say about any other automaker. I think Apple actually, I think, has tremendous trust from its users, uh, a shocking amount sometimes, you know, the, the degree to which people are uh, obsessed with that company. I think if they were to build a car, people would presume, they, they hold them to a higher standard, but historically Apple has been able to live up to that higher standard, and I think they would with a car as well. Bob, what do you make of this reporting that Apple is tripling the number of people that are working on 
this car project? Why don't they just buy Tesla? Well, I think they want to find a way to provide the Apple level of innovation. I mean, this is one do of you, the... Do you think Tesla doesn't have that level well, of Well, I think Apple, I think Tesla does, but you look at the car industry, there's a lot of players, there's a lot of opportunities. It's a very highly segmented market, and I think Apple believes that they can bring a unique set of values to this. My question is, look, yes, there's a lot of tech in cars, but there's a lot of mechanical elements in cars, right? And Apple has no history of doing the mechanical piece, the engines and all the other, the drivetrain and all those elements. Now, not to say they can't bring those skill sets in-house, but to me, that is the fundamental question. I agree, Apple's got a tremendous brand and they will work very hard if they are in fact to do this to achieve the kind of trust with a car that they want. But they just see this as part of that ever evolving mm -hmm. world of connected devices and they feel like they need to be there. I don't know about you, David, but it's hard not to get excited about an Apple car. I mean, maybe that's extremely naive, but, but really, it, it, it's hard not to be excited about this. It is hard not to be excited, and I'll tell you, I, I think I disagree that I, I think Apple has fundamental advantages. In fact, if you look at the reviews of the iPhone 6S, a lot of them are saying, you know, one of the problems is Apple has us too sucked into their ecosystem and we can't get out. Well, you know, we, our smartphones work with our cars now and our, who knows how Apple may build a car that integrates with the other technology we have in a more elegant and irresistible way than anybody else can because they control so much else of our technology. That's something that Tesla doesn't have access to. So I think actually if Apple did build a car, it would be as tied into all of our other Apple devices as our iPhone is, and that would in itself be a fundamental advantage for them. All right, well, speaking of iPhone, we're going to give you our review of the new iPhone 6S. David Kirkpatrick of Techonomy, thanks so much. Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis, it's great to have you. So, staying with Apple, the official reviews of the iPhone 6S and 6S Plus are out today. And while it doesn't look much different from the outside, a lot has changed on the inside. Bloomberg's Sam Grobart gives us his take. This is the new Apple iPhone 6S and 6S Plus, and let me cut right to the chase. Should you buy one? Yeah, probably. Eight years since it debuted, I still think the iPhone is the best smartphone you can buy. Android phones have made some tremendous improvements, and Apple's definitely had some missteps along the way, but the way Apple is able to both develop the hardware and the software together still makes for the best user experience. These new S models are typical of the usual two-year iPhone product cycle. Nothing looks terribly different on the outside, but a lot's changed inside. Let's start with the display. Apple's added another dimension to multi-touch and called it, fittingly, 3D touch. Basically, if you press harder than normal, you can pull up shortcuts for different apps. It's a little bit like right-click on your mouse. A couple of things about this, though. First, 3D touch does take a little getting used to push the wrong way, and you just wind up getting all your apps to do that jiggling thing when you want to move them around the screen. Then there's the matter of what you can do with 3D Touch. Right now, things are a little bit limited. It's better, sure, that I can preview a mail message in my inbox or jump to a new note, but other uses are more questionable. Who exactly needs a shortcut to call up a private browsing page? Fortunately, Apple's allowing third-party developers to use the technology, so we may see more clever applications in the future. The other big changes have to do with the Success's cameras. The rear-facing one's been upgraded to 12 megapixels and can now shoot ultra-high-resolution 4K video. It can also take a new type of picture called Live Photo, which captures the moments before and after the shutter's been released. One thought about all these live photos and 4K video, they do take up more room on your phone. So if you're in the Apple Store, walk right past that 16 gigabyte model and get an iPhone with more storage. The front-facing camera can now take better selfies thanks to a display that can act like a flash. It'll even match the ambient color of the room so you don't come out looking like a zombie. But what makes these new iPhones the best smartphones you can buy are the fundamentals. The new A9 processor is ludicrously fast, as is the Touch ID sensor, which now works instantly. There's also a raft of improvements thanks to the Success's new operating system, iOS 9. You can now activate a battery-saving low power mode, get transit directions on maps, and find things faster thanks to an improved search and Siri. Hello. New features are what usually get the headlines, but it's these behind-the-scenes upgrades that really matter. 
Thanks to blindingly fast hardware and well-designed software, these new iPhones actually begin to sort of fade away and let you focus more on what you're doing. The best things about the new iPhone 6S and 6S Plus aren't all the new things that grab your attention. It's all the stuff in the background that you never notice. Coming up, Microsoft just released a new version of Office, the first update in three years. We'll show you some of the latest features. Plus, we will hear from the winner of Google's annual science fair and VIP guest, a 14-year-old NASA enthusiast and budding inventor, Ahmed Mohammed. That is next. Now to a story we are watching, Groupon, the daily deals and coupon site, announced today that it will be cutting 1,100 jobs in a massive restructuring. The company will also be shutting down operations in seven countries worldwide. Groupon was once the leader in the online coupon market, but has since struggled to boost sales. In a blog post, CEO Rich Williams said that, quote, in order for our geographic footprint to be an even bigger advantage, we need to focus our energy and dollars on fewer countries. You may remember my hilariously failed attempt to get an interview with Andrew Mason, then CEO, immediately after the company went public. Concerns at that point were already mounting around Groupon's business model. Since then, the stock has fallen 79%. Now to Microsoft, taking on the likes of Google Docs by introducing Office 2016, the first big upgrade to Office in three years, making it much easier to share, collaborate, and edit doc documents, for example, in Microsoft Word. More than 1.2 billion people use Office, and Office is still Microsoft's single biggest product with sales of $23.5 billion in the latest fiscal year. So just how important is this upgrade? How does it fit into Satya Nadella's vision for Microsoft and its future? Joining me now to discuss, Chris Capocella, Microsoft Executive Vice President and CMO. Chris, thank you so much much for joining us today on Bloomberg West. It's so great to have you here. Thank you very much. So, so what exactly is new? Yeah, well, with Office 2016, we've really focused on collaboration and teamwork, as you mentioned. So we've made it much easier for people to work inside a document together, one-click sharing, uh, easy ways to work with Skype within Word, within Excel, within PowerPoint, so we can chat, video conference, et cetera, while we work on the document. But we've also made it a lot easier for teams of people to work together, to have shared conversations, shared calendars, et cetera, outside of a document. So really collaboration throughout the entire suite is a big focus for us. It's interesting because, you know, obviously Google Docs has been around for a long time now. Yeah. You've got Slack, which is sort of a, a slick alternative. The UI of Microsoft Office hasn't actually changed that much. A lot of these changes are very subtle. And I yeah. wonder how you balance, you know, catering to your loyal users who've been using this for decades and getting new people on board. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great point. For us, the familiarity of Office is a real strength. And if we can bring new ways of collaborating right in the Office experience, inside of Outlook, inside of Excel, where people spend so much of their time, they don't have to learn a different way of working. And so from that perspective, it can become very familiar right away. And yet they're starting to work in new, interesting ways. We've also made the Office application available on the iPhone, on Android devices, to reach customers that might not be Office users today. And we've been thrilled that 150 million people have downloaded those applications for iOS and Android, giving us a whole new set of customers to introduce to Office, and that's critical for us. So there are 20 different Office products or so. I mean, there's a lot of different products out there. Then you have Office 365, which is the, the cloud-based subscription version. You've got the on-premise version. You've got the apps. What should I buy? Well, Office 365 is really the thing that we think the vast majority of people will buy. It is, And that's the, also what you want people to buy, For right? sure, absolutely. It's the cloud subscription for Office. So it gives you all of the applications, but it gives you those applications for your entire family and across all your devices. So you don't have to worry about, am I allowed to put it on this PC or that Mac? If you have Office 365, you can put it on, on all your devices. And we introduce new features every month now. So no longer will it be three years before you get something 
new. And if you have the subscription, you get those new features automatically. Uh, you don't have to install it. You don't have to manage it anymore. So we'll give people choice for how they buy, but for sure we think the subscription is what they'll want. So there's a big Skype integration here yes. as well. There was a big Skype outage recently. How do you prevent these kind of issues, these kinds of network issues? Well, for us, we have to have the world's most sophisticated data center operations, uh, better than anybody, anybody else on the planet. All of these tech companies are going to have an outage from time to time, but mm -hmm. you know, you have to do everything you can to communicate with your customers when you do have a problem and then fix it as soon as humanly possible. In the case of the Skype outage, we were happy to be up and running uh, after you know, a relatively small number of hours. So getting better and better every time is our goal. You've also been buying a number of iOS and Android apps to, to productivity yes. apps. Are we going to be seeing more of this? How yes. is this part of, you know, Satya Nadella, Nadella's vision for the future? Yeah, for sure. We've done some great acquisitions that have brought us Outlook on the iPhone, a great calendaring app for the iPhone. And at times we'll build our own apps when we think that's the fastest route to market. But if there's a great app out there that we think complements Office really well, we'll absolutely continue with those types of acquisitions. Whatever is the fastest to market with, I think, the best outcome is what we're looking for. All right. Chris Caposella, Chief Marketing Officer at Microsoft. Thanks so much for joining us today here Thank you so on much. Bloomberg West. Well, Google hosted its fifth annual science fair yesterday, and Bloomberg West was there to meet all the young scientists and speak to the winner, Oliva Hallisey, a 17-year-old from Connecticut. She devised a diagnostic test to detect Ebola. We asked her why she picked this project. The Ebola outbreak really drew me because I found it devastating how quickly it grows and just destroys the fabric of these areas. But the biggest star of the night was surprise guest Ahmed Mohammed, the 14-year-old freshman from Irvine, Texas, who made headlines last week when his homemade clock got him suspended from school. Ahmed visited the booths of the finalists, and he also got to meet with Google co-founder Sergey Brin. He posted a picture on his Twitter account saying, thanks, Google, for saving me a seat at the Google Science Fair. Amazing projects and people. Coming up, President Xi is in Seattle ahead of a meeting with top tech leaders. Why are these CEOs so eager to speak with him? We will have that after this quick break. Plus, iPhone purchasing power will use the 6S to measure the gender pay gap in the United States. Our findings next. It is time now for the Daily Bite, one number that tells a whole lot. And today's number is eight. According to Bloomberg Research, a woman must work eight more hours than a man in the same profession to afford an iPhone 6S in the United States. We're calling this the iPhone Gender Pay Gap Index. Bloomberg used U.S. Census Bureau data to compare men and women's earnings across professions from bartenders to CEO and found the disparity to be on average a full day's earnings. The gender gap is greatest among restaurant and coffee shop hosts where women must work about 47% longer than their male colleagues to afford the same iPhone. That's not okay. But while this data is troubling, Bloomberg did find some professions where men, men are disadvantaged for pay. Female nuclear technicians can apparently afford the iPhone 6 faster than their male counterparts. Interesting. Now to China and Seattle. Chinese President Xi Jinping is in Seattle as part of his first state visit to the United States. This stopover provides a rare opportunity for China to meet with U.S. tech executives like Apple's Tim Cook. But tensions between the two countries remain high over alleged cyber attacks. So what will this trip to Seattle accomplish? Joining me now from Seattle, Bloomberg News reporter Ramey Innocencio, who is on the ground for us there. So first of all, Ramey, paint the picture for us. What's the atmosphere like? Who's there so far? Sure thing, Emily, and good to speak with you. Right now, I am in front of the Westin Seattle. This is where President Xi Jinping checked in earlier today. He's out and about for meetings with uh, uh, governors from China as well as local executives. Uh, he's going to come back today, and he's going to give his first policy speech here and potentially his only policy speech of his whole entire week. In terms of the atmosphere, earlier this morning, there were about a few hundred uh, uh, supporters as well as a few critics of President Xi being here in China. A lot of people 
were waving U.S. and China flags. Uh, looking ahead, there is an air of um, skepticism, anticipation to see what's going to happen here in the tech industry, as well as, of course, when President Xi goes off to Washington, D.C. on September 24th to meet with uh, President Obama. On that note, Ramey, President Xi gave a very rare interview to the Wall Street Journal on this issue of cyber attacks. He said the Chinese government does not engage in theft of commercial secrets in any form, nor does it encourage or support Chinese companies to engage in such practices in any way. We're ready to strengthen cooperation with the United States side on this issue. What reaction are you getting from people on the ground to that statement, whereby it certainly sounds like he's saying, we don't hack, but everyone sort of agrees, yes, they do. <laughs> You know, you basically said it. Anyone who has heard that quote will probably raise an eyebrow and say, really? But of course, when you look back at even the past year, I mean, look, at least three major, uh, uh, major hacks have happened over the past year by China-backed hackers. Uh, the most recent, of course, we're talking about was this past summer with the Office of Personnel Management. China-backed hackers uh, got the information of about 20 million former and federal workers. That also included uh, United Airlines, as well as, of course, Healthcare Anthem. So a lot of people are concerned that uh, this really is happening. And White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest did come out this morning and had this to say. Take a listen. Our principal concerns center around what we have described as government-sponsored cyber-enabled theft of confidential business information uh, and proprietary technology from U.S. companies for financial gain. Uh, and that has been... Uh, uh, something that we have long been concerned about. It, frankly, it predates the, uh, the administration of, of President Xi. And, you know, Emily, regardless of what's happening with cyber espionage between the U.S. as well as China, uh, companies here in the U.S. still want greater access over in China. And the same, of course, is true for Chinese companies trying to get into the United States. And that will be addressed tomorrow at the Paulson Institute when 15 major CEOs, many of them tech companies, are going to be meeting with U.S. Exec executives here. All right, Bloomberg's Ramey in Asensio in Seattle, where President Xi Jinping is about to speak. Ramey uh, will be covering this for us all day tomorrow. Do not miss it on Bloomberg Television. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg West. Tomorrow we've got a great show. Sam Altman of Y Combinator will be here. Don't miss it.